I'm a lecturer in genetics here in uh, Trinity. So um, as you probably have learned from the stand outside, there are two ways to do genetics. One, one, one way you can do this is through the science course and you specialize in uh, third and fourth year, so you make your choices during second year. And the other way is a direct entry course as human genetics. And the two courses have a lot of similarity. The emphasis is on uh, the human aspects of genetics in the other course, but um, the two classes spend a lot of time together and they're, they're, both classes are very much full members of our department. One thing you'll notice if you do genetics here, or if you talk to any of the students actually, if you meet any of our genetic students, um, we really do welcome the students really as members of our department. So when you're in the department, um, you have use of the building, people come into this area, here you can see this is the building, and here actually this is, this is a photograph taken just before it was occupied, but now there's all tables and chairs here and people have coffee and lunch, and so it's actually an important part of um, of a university and of a, of a discipline is that the opportunity to interact with each other and we really try to facilitate this so it might sound like it's just socializing but actually this is where people meet and sometimes you know somebody will come to coffee and they go god I'm really stuck on this thing and somebody else will go you know I can help you so actually it's an important thing so um, genetics is uh, is molecular biology which means we're thinking about biology at the molecular level and the main molecule we're talking about in terms of Genetics is DNA, and we're thinking about DNA, the, how the DNA works, what parts of that DNA make genes, how those genes operate, how they interact with each other, how they work correctly, and how they work incorrectly, otherwise known as disease. And um, at the center of the genetics as a way of looking at life, we can place the, the genome. This here is the cover page of this journal, Nature, which was in the main international journals, when the human genome sequence came out. And actually, that's going to be 10 years ago next month, in February. So you'll probably see a good few things on the TV celebrating 10 years since the human genome. This was an amazing achievement. And, um, it's, and I'm proud to say that me, along with a couple of other of my colleagues here, were actually involved in this. And I continue to be involved in really important genetics that's going on in, on an international scale, an international stage. And so the kind of things that go on, I'm going to give you a bit of a flavor here for a lot of the different stuff that goes on within our department, and then I'm just going to give you one kind of little story to do with um, the evolution of HIV. So um, some of the work that goes on in our department is to do with plant genetics. We depend on plants a lot. They are the only organisms that have so far managed to successfully and efficiently harness the energy from the sun by photosynthesis, of course. So we depend on them for energy energy, either directly or indirectly, and um, we're all, they're also interesting model organisms, they're important crops, but they're also interesting just for understanding um, growth and development in a, in a basic sense, in a broad sense across all of, uh, in terms of the commonalities across biology. And if you think about it, like we, we develop in a certain way, like from a, from a fertilized egg we develop and our arms and our legs grow in the right place, and if you lose an arm it never grows back again. Um, plants are different because they don't have a shape. They can kind of grow in many different ways and you can cut bits off and things grow back again. So the similarities and the differences are opportunities to, to learn something fundamental about the way development works. We also have work going on. Can you see the, yeah, you can see the kind of, I'm using the mouse as a pointer. We have work going on with um, domesticated animals, including chickens and cows and understanding um, these in terms of the history of them, in terms of the impact this has had on humans and human evolution and also we have um, within the same group they're studying also human evolution so they've talked about Irish origins and aspects of genetics that are particular to Ireland and there's an interesting thing in, in fact where these tie together in terms of the kind of agricultural lifestyle and um, looking at human evolution because when we started when Europeans started using milk as an important dietary source this had an impact on the way that our uh, that we evolved because as you probably know you ha uh, babies feed on milk exclusively and so they have lactase which will help make the milk digestible and most adults don't have this except in dairy cultures in, co in parts of the world where people eat, eat and drink a lot of milk based products then we have lactase persistence into adulthood so this happened in Europeans and in one African tribe where they also use milk in their, in their diet, but not in other parts of the world. This is, this is showing you here, this picture here is an actual photograph down a microscope that's been enhanced in terms of um, 
uh, of lighting things up using some molecular genetics tools to light things up, but this is a fly embryo, the embryo of a, a Drosophila mel melanogaster fly, which is commonly used for experiments. And the, the bits that you can see here, you can, just, you can probably see this red thing, so it's, uh, and this is, this is, these are uh, neurons in the fly, and so you, you can look down the microscope, and by setting up your experiment carefully, you can watch and see how these things develop. And they don't just develop randomly. It's not that things just grow out and kind of like the roots of a tree. They don't. They follow kind of quite clearly defined paths, and these paths are defined genetically. And so by understanding these things, we can understand a lot of fundamentals in terms of neurogenetics and the simple, simple situation inside a fly, and we can start extrapolating that to our own more complex brains. So this shows you here, this is just one example, so one particular disease that there's a lot of research going on in the genetics department here, and in fact it's one of, some of the world leaders, as, as far as I know, in terms of this research, is a genetic form of blindness called retinitis pigmentosa. And in th this, is, th this is caused by mutations in the rhodopsin gene, so you might have heard of the opsins or the light-sensitive uh, light sex sensitive proteins in your eye and so there's rhodopsin which is in the rod cells as, of, as opposed to the color ones which are in the cone cells and so a mutation in this gene um, means that somebody certain mutations mean that somebody who's born with normal sight and um, has a childhood with normal sight at a certain point in their adulthood starts to progressively lose their sight and become eventually completely blind and um, so they, they work here was uh, they were among the first to discover which genes were involved in this so just they discovered that the rhodopsin gene is involved in this among other genes and they're also trying to develop therapies for this at a genetic level so this means you're trying to reintroduce a, a correctly functioning gene to replace the faulty gene and at the moment this is a very it's very much an experimental stage and um, we hope it's going to work but with any science you don't know what's going to work that's the whole point right if you knew already you wouldn't be doing the experiment but in any case it's really promising it's really interesting it's really exciting and it's utterly cutting edge and also another area of research within the department is what's on what's called apoptosis which is what is otherwise known as programmed cell death so cell death, you might think, is normally a, a bad thing, and in fact, it can be a bad thing. There's a, another one called necrosis, which is, a, which is a kind of a messy cell death. It's basically when a cell kind of bursts and dies, and that means you kind of get a mess in the tissue around, and you get inflammation and all kinds of bad things. Apoptosis is this really carefully um, timed and programmed cell death, and it doesn't explode. It makes all these little kind of bubbles, these little blebs, which then get eaten by white blood cells. A few things you might not know, during embryonic development, all of you had webbed fingers, a bit like, you know, ducks' webbed feet, and the cells the, in between your fingers died, not randomly, but in a programmed way, p carefully, and at the right time to leave you with these normal separated fingers. And a uh, tadpole loses its tail by apoptosis, this isn't randomly just drifting away, it's carefully timed and programmed. And this happens all the time during your, your, during your life. There are cells that are supposed to die. And if they don't die, another word for when, uh, when, cell, when cell death is not happening is cancer, essentially. So by understanding apoptosis, you can get a really good handle on uh, cancer. As a student, I was attracted to, the, to genetics because you could do so many different things. I didn't really know exactly what I was interested in. It turned out I ended up doing evolutionary genetics and loving that, but I didn't even know that really existed beforehand and I wasn't sure that, that was what I was going to necessarily like so it's it's a way of approaching biology but we do all kinds of different biology you've seen that so like there's uh, there's biology with medical rele relevance there's conservation biology there's understanding human genetics and human history and so now is uh, I'm just going to tell you a bit about how a uh, genetical and evolutionary approach can actually be rel relevant in a very modern sense it's, so sometimes when you think about evolution, you're thinking it's only historical, but it's not only historical, it can tell you very current things. And not only that, by looking at the way genes evolve, we can see, we can really get an understanding to how they operate correctly. And as I briefly mentioned already, um, understanding how they operate correctly is the other side of understanding when they go wrong, when disease. Now we're going to talk about HIV. So when HIV, uh, you're all too young to remember any of this, but when HIV first appeared, it wasn't known, it, was, it wasn't understood at all. There was just this mysterious illness that was killing people, and um, it, was, it, was, it was 
utterly mysterious. People didn't know what it was. There was this weird thing because, of course, what the people were actually dying of was all kinds of different things because, as you probably know by now, it causes immunodeficiency. So you might die of pneumonia or some other kind of infection that you would expect normally wouldn't kill what appeared to be a healthy uh, young person. And this was, this was the mystery. And it took a long time, actually, before people started understanding that there was a, a common thread between these different deaths and that it was in fact caused by a virus. So I, I took this kind of B-movie um, B movie theme because I was trying to make, just to make it a bit more silly for a bit of fun. But in any case, when, when people started, when the first, first understanding of, of HIV and this mysterious illness, because more or less summed up in this poster anyway, because they could have just described it as the thing, and that was about all the information they had. They didn't understand it at all. Um, of course, then the things moved on and they could describe it as a blob, which isn't such an inaccurate, uh, inaccurate description if you look at this. So this is a human cell, and those red things are HIV um, attacking and entering the cell. And um, what, this is what it looks like in cartoon form. So here you have a human cell, and this is a HIV particle, which comes along, which comes along and it doesn't just explode and bang into the cell. There's a, there's a, a, a interaction between proteins on the outside of the virus and proteins on the outside of your cell and um, no you have to wait and you have to be quiet and uh, so what happens is you see here this blue thing here is the there's the actual RNA of the virus so the HIV doesn't have DNA it has RNA so the RNA comes along it enters into the cell and it gets converted into DNA. So this is normally, you've probably heard in your genetics classes in your Leaving Cert courses, that you've got DNA which gets transcribed into RNA which then makes a protein. And that's the normal direction, so it's DNA makes RNA. But here we have RNA makes DNA. So this is, I'm sorry about this, they promised me they'd be good. Um, so this is the DNA which actually gets here, what you see here, the grey, is the, your human DNA. And so what happens with HIV is the the virus genome gets incorporated into the human genome and it converts that human cell into a HIV making factory essentially. So it's, based, it's hijacking the function of your cell to make loads and loads more viruses and this is what it does. And in terms of how this ends up ca causing AIDS, this again was something that took a lot of work to understand and in any of these things, any kind of scientific progress is never the work of one man or one woman in one lab, it's always uh, in, in many respects, a uh, global effort. People are working around the world. What you do is when you find something you publish in a scientific journal, somebody else can read that. They can, they can say, oh, they've done this experiment, and that makes me think of another experiment I can do. And it, all be, it, it does become quite a collective effort. It is really a scientific community in many respects. And so in terms of trying to understand how this caused AIDS, it wasn't uh, very well understood, in this, and it was scary, like this big man mantis. And um, so this shows you here what happens and so you, the blue line here are the T cells in uh, your body, which are an important part of your immune system. And the green one is the number of virus. And it, the virus is living specifically inside these blue cells. And um, so what happens is that you have a normal level of the T cells in your body. And um, as the vi so initially there's a peak when the virus initially infects and it tails off a bit. And then as the, as the infection gets worse and worse and worse, the number of these T cells drops. And, and when it drops below a threshold, which is around about 200 cells per cubic millimeter of blood, then that is what is called AIDS. It's that you don't have enough T cells to mount an efficient immune response. So the virus causes the syndrome by demolishing the population of T cells in your body, essentially. So that's what happens. And so um, this is a global problem, as you probably know. Um, there's a huge number of people worldwide infected with HIV, as about uh, 50 million people. It's not the same everywhere in the world. Some parts of the world have a particularly bad problem. And this is true for both um, historical reasons and political reasons, unfortunately. So the virus did originate in Africa, as you'll see later, and uh, that's part of why it's worse there, but it's also for political reasons that um, in, some, in some cases, um, in proper interventions and information and medicine haven't been delivered as they should be, and that is a big shame. That is something we should all be ashamed of. But in any case, this is, so this is a big problem. It's all over the world, and um, and this is not something to be, uh, 
ignored and not something to be taken lightly. So in terms of HIV then, there's important questions we'd like to answer and we can take a scientific approach to answering these. So one is where, so we've got the where, why, how. Where did it come from? Why can't we make a vaccine? You probably know that there's no such thing as a HIV vaccine, even though many people have been trying for about 30 years now. And how come some people are resistant? And you might not have known that some people are resistant, but they are. So in terms of where it came from, well, we could have summarized this. In this. So again, the Bean movie um, answers are just about as good as any. So from outer space, from beneath the sea, but um, the newspapers weren't a lot better either. So um, this newspaper, there was lots of theories and conspiracy theories. So here's one, um, AIDS made in lab and accidentally release, released. Um, Hitler created AIDS. <laughs> uh, well, so this isn't, this isn't actually the, the British Sun. This is an American version which is, I think, a monthly magazine. And the front page of this exact same issue ran with the headline, Stuffed Bunny Makes Three Girls Pregnant. So um, <laughs> you, get the, you get the journalistic standards. But um, you know, so then you can say, well, OK, you know, OK, Stuffed Bunny Makes Three Girls Pregnant. That's a scientific hypothesis. And we can evaluate it scientifically. You know, we, can, we can do a paternity test or something. So you, know, you, you can take these crazy things, and you can actually be sensible about them. So when you're trying to talk, so you can, you can take these things and you can be scientific about it. You can, test, you can test the plausibility of whether Hitler created it because that says, well, it was made during this period in time. And with genetics, we can actually, um, by looking at how different things are, we can relate that to time. So we can say, no, no, actually, this entered human populations much earlier than that. We know now that HIV entered human populations around about the turn of the 20th century, which is well before Hitler. And uh, so we can, we can take these, even these crazy ideas and we can, and we can answer them with, in a scientific approach. And so in terms of an evolutionary approach to understanding um, HIV, you can think of this as like a kind of a family type thing. So you probably know already that genes are passed from parent to child and, and that for that reason, genes are more similar between close relatives. So if you think of this is a simple evolutionary tree, you have a man who has two sons and then they have their children, right? So if this is you, this person is your sibling, you've got your father, your uncle and your cousins, okay? Family tree, that's easy enough. And so this is over a very short amount of time. The, di the, dis the difference between when you were born and when you were, your grandfather was born might be about 60 or 70 years or something like that, or maybe even less. So the amount of time we see here is relatively short. If we add a lot more time, then we're talking about species divergences. So the exact same processes that you've got individuals who are, you're, you're more similar to the ones that you're more closely related to, just add more time, it's the exact same processes, it's just more time, and you've got a species tree instead of a family tree. So you've got humans more related to chimp than it is to mouse, which shouldn't be a big surprise to anybody here. And so if you want to take an evolutionary approach to understanding HIV, then you can just rephrase this question. So we're asking, where did HIV come from? So what really we're asking is, what are the relatives of HIV. So we have HIV here. Who are the siblings and the cousins of HIV? So wh what are the relatives of HIV? So it turns out there are other viruses that are very similar to HIV, and these are called uh, simian immunodeficiency viruses. So ours is human immunodeficiency virus. This is simian, simian uh, meaning monkey. And, um, so it, and we can compare human immunodeficiency virus to this virus in monkeys, although it's worth noting that actually it's called immunodeficiency virus there just because human was the first one that was described. It doesn't cause immunodeficiency in monkeys, and that's another interesting point that's worth remembering. So what you see here is that there's all these different monkeys and, and an ape who have different types of this virus. So these different kinds of monkeys have them. They have them very commonly. Almost all adults would have them. They're living happily with them, a bit like uh, many people in this room probably have the cold sore virus and it's no big deal, right? So, you know, there's plenty of viruses we can live with that don't really make us sick. And what we've seen from the comparing the virus present in lots of different monkeys and in chimp and comparing the ones that you can find in humans is that the main HIV virus, as in the one that's found most around the world, it's called HIV-1, that came to us from chimps. And chimps got it from a, a kind of a hybridization of virus between, from these two different monkeys. So we got it from chimps. And it actually has happened more than once. It's happened at least twice. There's another kind of HIV that so far hasn't spread much out of Africa, but that came directly from this monkey called the sooty mangabe. And there are 
other probable cases. So this happens because people are using um, the, these other primates for bushmeat. And if you imagine hunting, it's a very messy thing. You're going to catch an animal. They're probably, uh, they probably mi they might do some butchering on, on the site, which means, of course, there's a lot of blood there. You might cut yourself, and then you've got an opportunity for uh, a transmission. This is where I have a very serious point to make, actually. So um, you see here, you probably, you probably know already that human and chimp are very similar, without me having to say this. And I mentioned already that this virus doesn't make monkey sick and doesn't make chimp sick. And so we have this tiny genetic difference between human and chimp. So somewhere in that tiny genetic difference is the difference that makes us get sick and die from this virus and allows chimp to survive. And so there's something really important in that, in that tiny difference. Of course, there's, not, there's, there's many other differences between us. This is part of why we're very interested in that 2% in that difference. But um, there, there's, there's something interesting to be learned there in terms of how to tackle this virus. So then in terms of why can't we make a vaccine, if you think about vaccines, what they normally do is they're basically educating your immune system to recognize a pathogen. They're giving it a little taster. It's usually going to be... It's your, when I'm finished. So usually what you do is... When I'm finished talking. You, um, usually what they do is you provide something like a dead copy of... Uh, a dead copy of the virus or maybe one that's alive but can't make you sick. So your, your immune system is going to produce antibodies against that. And um, the, the, vaccine, um, the vaccine science has been hugely successful. It's eradicated pox, smallpox. Um, it's c really controlled other things like polio. And, um, and, if you th and in terms of the rabies virus, um, this one was developed by Pasteur, the same guy who uh, developed pasteurization and many other important advances. And in fact, the virus that he developed still works today because this virus changes really, really slowly. So the virus he wore, the, 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 the vaccine he developed is still going to protect you against uh, the virus that might be around today. Influenza changes faster, and as you probably know, there's a new flu vaccine every year. And this is because the flu changes quite quickly. And so each year you need a new one because it's going to be a new circulating strain of virus. So just think about this, and it goes even faster in HIV. So what happens with HIV is it evolves extraordinarily fast. It evolves so quickly that um, it, any, any two people who are infected are going to have a slightly different version. Even one person who's infected for several years, you can see that the virus changing just uh, just in that person. And so what happens is you imagine you'd use this virus to try and make a vaccine. You build it up and you get these blue antibodies. And by the time you've got it ready, because it takes time, you've got to grow it and produce it. And by the time you've got it ready, the virus is different already and it doesn't work. So whereas with, with influenza, you've got a year to work with. You've got a year before you need a new one. And that's enough time when you, when you, when you work really hard. The people who make the influenza vaccines work really, really hard to do this on time. Um, but with HIV, there just is no time. So the vaccines are going out of date faster than they can be made. So, and our last million dollar question for HIV is how come some people are resistant? And you possibly didn't even know that some people are. This was discovered completely by accident because there were so, a few people who were living what you might call very risky lifestyles. Right? So they were um, using drugs, sharing needles with people who were infected and things like this. And somehow were not getting infected. And doctors noticed this. And they were trying, there's a few people like this. They tried to find what was in common between them. And they discovered there's one gene that these people shared, which is so we all have a copy of a gene called uh, chemokine receptor 5. We all have that. And people who are resistant have a different version of it. And there's a bit missing from the middle of it. And um, basically, what, hap so what happens is that um, that makes the protein different. So here we see this initially, I showed you this picture at the beginning, where the HIV virus comes along and it binds to these proteins on the outside of the human cell. And that binding then allows the interaction and allows the virus to enter the cell. It, 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 it's, a, it's kind of a specific process. It's not just a collision and a crash. And what happens in the people who have this other version of that gene, this protein, um, the recognition doesn't occur anymore. There's no recognition between the protein on the outside of the human cell and the protein on the virus anymore. So the virus can't enter. So these people are, are lucky, very lucky. And um, if you look here, this shows you the distribution of this particular variant of the gene, this allele, uh, 
throughout this part of the world and, and it's highest where it's this dark red and it's lower where it tapers down to this pale blue. And you can see, you can see this is a gene that has existed for a while in human populations to have spread this far throughout the world. Um, it must be around for a while. In fact, it's been around longer than HIV has. So we know that it's only actually a coincidence that it protects against HIV. It existed before HIV was in human populations. And um, so we don't really know actually why, uh, what, um, why this gene has spread throughout human populations. It could be just one of those things, you know, like we, a lot of us in this room are going to have different blood groups from each other. It doesn't have any influence on our health, but it's a genetic difference. And, it's, and that's a genetic difference you find throughout the world. And this happens sometimes. You have things which are completely neutral and they just spread throughout the world because it's no big shakes. Or it could be, there's another theory though, that this actually conferred some kind of resistance to either smallpox or plague, which are much older um, uh, pathogens that have affected a lot of people globally and so would, uh, where there would have been an advantage for some people to be resistant to these um, if they had some genetic uh, factor that helped them. So we don't really know, it's a puzzle and puzzles are interesting and, um, and it's, an, it's an important kind of puzzle as well. So there's still a lot to be learned there. So um, that's all I was going to talk to you about today. I want to say thanks to Paul Sharp who uh, gave me some pictures, that's me obviously. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and I'll take any questions you have and thank you for listening and tolerating my offspring. <laughs> <laughs>